Okay, our next presenter is from uh, the Leonard Strellis Diabetes and Metabolic Center, the neuroendocrine unit uh, at the EVMS. Please welcome Dr. Aaron Vinnick. Thanks very much, Bob, and thank you very much to you all uh, for being here today. <coughs> My uh, presentation is not quite going to follow the handouts because when I look through the handout, I realize there are just too many slides. So uh, hmm, there you go, amen. And just uh, as Tom Rizzo said to me, he said, are there any letters in the alphabet that can follow your name? So I had to shorten that to <laughs> So, uh, w what I'm going to try and get through with you today you know, are some of the changes that have occurred uh, in uh, uh, people with neuroendocrine tumors. Some of the things that are happening in the field in relationship of our ability to identify them, the changes in the epidemiology. Uh, you know, we used to think of this as a Cinderella condition, but I think Cinder Cinderella is now wearing the glass slippers and she's going to the ball. So, we will talk a little uh, about that too. And then I'm going to fit into the picture for you. The, some of the therapies that have just come through and have just been approved, uh, and which I think will now enter the therapeutic arena uh, for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. So you've heard this, that if you don't suspect it, you won't detect it. So my objectives this morning are to provide an overview of neuroendocrine tumors. That's NETS, neuroendocrine tumors, in which we include uh, carcinoid, and PNETS, uh, which uh, are the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and their syndromes. I want to highlight the importance of accurate diagnosis and early intervention, and then I'll go further and talk about the methods used for diagnosis, right, for diagnosis of NETS. So this is the way it was. You, you see this uh, little girl sitting over here who's angry as anything. Uh, she, she, represents, she represents NETS. Because here's a little boyfriend kissing the other little girl. That's the rest of cancer. So it's because it's the neglected side that people get upset with this over here. But they shouldn't be because this is the data. If you now uh, look at the prevalence of NETS, there are more common neuroendocrine tumors than cancer of the stomach and cancer of the pancreas combined. So, so you get a different feel when you actually look at this and what emphasis there should be. Now, I've, I've taken this from uh, James Yao's publication from the SEER database. And if you look at all these other cancers here that occur, the incidence of all malignant neoplasms over time, over the, uh, the period from 1973 to 2004, there's been no real increase, just a slight increase. But this is what has happened with NETS. They've increased 5.5 fold over the same period of time. So you may say we got smarter. We're finding them more often. People are beginning to recognize the association, or we simply have better tests to identify those two. So I think all of those contribute uh, to the rising incidence of NETS. It becomes, therefore, very important for you to have accurate diagnosis and early intervention. And I'm going to show you why. Because let us see what happens if you have a localized tumor in terms of survival. So if, we, if you have a localized tumor and we take this period of about 10 years, you have about an 80% chance of being alive 10 years later. If the tumor has spread and, uh, to distant metastases and we look at your 50% chance of survival, you only have a 50% chance of survival for 10 years. But if it is now spread to distant sites, the 50% survival is down to about three years. So when do you want to diagnose the tumor? When it's localized, before it's spread, before it's spread locally, and before it's spread to distant sites. And that is really critical to us. It's shown in another way. Your five-year survival probability for nets with distant metastases of well to moderately differentiated in nets is 35%, but if it's poorly differentiated, it's only 4% completely different. So we want to try and identify them in the benign form. And here's our friend, the zebra. And you've heard about the hoof beats. When I came to this country originally, and uh, people, I came from South Africa originally, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and uh, a rare condition in South Africa 
was called a canary. So when I came here and they asked me what I worked in, I said, I worked in a canary disease. So they said, what's a canary? It's a little bird. So they said, oh, you mean a rare disease? They said, here we call them zebras. So I used to tell people when I originally came here that these uh, nets were as rare as rocking horse manure, <laughs> if you could picture that. But that's not the case anymore. That's a little different now. Now, uh, I have, it's also very different today. Today, uh, with the internet available, you can find out exactly who you want to talk to, who the good physicians are, where they are in the world. And I had just have a patient of mine from, where are you? Gaston. There he is. And who travels the whole world. He picks the physician that he wants to go to in the whole world. And then he travels around. And he sees the person who can do just the appropriate thing. We don't all enjoy that privilege. But it's good to know who you're dealing with, right? OK. And the, uh, if we now look at the neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract, the most common one by far that occurs in over half the cases, 56% of the, are carcinoids. All the others, the insulinomas, PPomas, gastronomas, biopomas, glucagonomas, somatostatinoma, go down in decreasing order, 1759, 211. But we all know somebody who's got one of these now. And all know that uh, they uh, test your ingenuity in terms of management. And I will share that with you today. This is the cell that does it all. It's a neuroendocrine cell. I've shown you here that it is capable of taking precursors such as tryptophan. It's just a simple amino acid. It takes up the tryptophan. And then when it takes up the tryptophan, it uh, then uh, uh, metabolizes the tryptophan by 5-hydroxylating it to 5-hydroxytryptophan and then to 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is the serotonin that you know about. It packages it in little granules over here, and it's like putting it in the warehouse and storing it in those granules. And then every time you need any, it will then secrete the, uh, the serotonin into the bloodstream from these secretory granules. And a couple of molecules accompany it. One molecule is called pancreastatin, and the other molecule is called uh, chromogranin, CGA. And you're going to hear more about that today as to how we utilize that piece of information for being able to know what's being secreted and to know what the predictive index of measuring these molecules, just because they're co-secreted. Now, this cell over here was called originally the Vasopella clear water cell. And I just want to get that clear water cell out of the way and show you what it's capable of. These proto-differentiated cells that occur throughout your gastrointestinal tract, throughout the whole body, and through the pancreas, are capable of differentiating into an alpha cell, the glucagonoma, the beta cell, an intracellulinoma, the delta cell, a somatostatinoma, a G cell, gastronoma, PP cell, PPoma. But they can also differentiate the enterochromaffin cell into all these others and form clinical syndromes that you least suspect such as Cushing's disease, acromegaly, the watery diarrhea syndrome, hypoglycemia, and the city of blastosis or grelinoma syndrome. So today, when you think of somebody with acromegaly, you think of a pituitary tumor. But if there's no tumor there, you think it's in the pancreas. If you think of Cushing's disease, you think of something in the pituitary or the adrenal. But if you don't find it there, you think pancreas or lung. So that, th that is the capability of these proto-differentiated stem cells to do just about anything. What is even more interesting is if you have one kind of tumor at one point in time, if you have a metastasis or spread, that tumor can make one of the other hormones. Or the same tumor can change the hormone it produces, and you get a different clinical syndrome at different points in time. So now let us look at the common clinical major manifestations, which are flushing, diarrhea, heart disease and bronchoconstriction, or an asthma-like clinical syndrome. But that's not the end of the story. Because what has evolved over time as we look after people is that up to a third of the patients will have diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. About 50%, one in two people has hypertension, and it's not your, your pheochromocytoma. Uh, there are people who get proximal muscle weakness, and it's very easy to recognize. They can't stand up when they're sitting in a chair. Uh, neuromyopathy, about 7%. Pigmentation, and even arthropathy, 
hyper or hypoglycemia, peptic ulcer disease, skin rashes, and psychological disturbances or depression. And I'm not going to talk to you today about the depression, but we have some very nice work going on right now uh, using quality of life measures with Dr. Oda Rizzo and looking at how depression relates to the different hormones that are produced. But what is new kid on the block is fever, fatigue, weight loss, and cachexia. And we think these are due to the production of cytokines such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, and NF-kappa B, a whole different scale of things that we used to associate with cancer. We're now associating with NETS. In addition to that, there are neurological syndromes, peripheral nerve damage, in uh, autonomic neuropathy, even cerebellar ataxia within coordination, myasthenia, and inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathies. And we think these are related to the fact that these tumors stimulate your body to make antibodies to nerve cells. And so you get the two consecutive. Now, for me, that turns out to be extremely interesting because you may have noticed that I'm from the neuroendocrine uh, unit uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, and my other major interest is nerve damage. So then my two worlds come together there. So this is a figure you'll see, I think, twice more today. It was originally constructed back uh, in 1989 with Reza Motari and me uh, when we were still in Michigan. And most people have a history at some point in time when they have vague abdominal symptoms of irritable bowel disease. We found that present in nearly 100% of the patients we reviewed. And these vague abdominal symptoms, the primary tumor is beginning to grow. And then the tumor starts metastasizing. It produces flushing, diarrhea, culminates in death, and the correct diagnosis is usually made here, 9.2 years after the onset of the symptom. And that's simply because we were blind. We simply couldn't recognize this. You'll see this figure again as it has changed because of what we've learned recently. What's happening underneath all this is that the tumor is small. It's, say, 1,000 cells. It's about 0.3 millimeters, too small for any detection system we have. It has micrometastases, small tumors spread, and it reaches about a million cells. When it reaches about a billion cells, then it is a macrometastasis, a tumor about that size, a centimeter, and now we can uh, find it. So that is one of the problems. Uh, the, the techniques we have are very sophisticated, but they're not sophisticated enough to be able to find these small tumors. So we need other markers. We need the symptoms, and we need biochemistry to tell us what, exactly what's happening. So here are the different types of tumors that we see. For primary tumor can be in the foregut from the esophagus going down to the first portion of the duodenum, include the pancreas, and we consider tumors in the ovary foregut as well because of the way they drain into the bloodstream. They behave like foregut tumors. Uh, lung is also considered to be foregut. Midgut are tumors that uh, involve the midgut all the way down to the ileocecal valve. That's the present in hindgut uh, uh, are from the ileocecal valve down to the colon and rectum. These tumors spread locally into the lymph nodes, but they can also form distant metastases into the liver, and the ones we are beginning to see now are bone. And one of the reasons we think that is occurring is because we're keeping people alive so much longer, we're beginning to see the distant spread to other sites, like to bone as well, and we have to deal with that. When you look at the pathology of and we can use standardized stains like hematoxylin. Eosin, as shown here, where you'll hear more about staining for chromogranin A. And this is a marker of cell division, chi 67. And here shows very low expression of chi, and that's very high. Now, the reason for wanting to know this is that they, we now look at a three-tier pathology system for NETs. And the first tier is a well-differentiated endocrine tumor or carcinoid. In the pancreas, it's a well-differentiated endocrine tumor. The next level is a well-differentiated endocrine carcinoma. It's malignant, but it's a very low grade of malignancy. And then the final tier is a poorly differentiated endocrine carcinoma, which is a high grade of malignancy and behaves like many other malignancies. And that is when it's no longer an odyssey in the land of slow-growing tumors. Now, the biomarkers, this is from the, you just heard about Dr. Ardell in Belfast, 
and the sustain of chromogranin and, and somatostatin receptor. And you're going to hear more from Dr. Odorizia about this. But note that there are a whole host of new things that we are interested in measuring in these tumors, which will have significant differences. And today, you will hear more about neurokinin, pancreastatin, and chromogranin, and what they mean to you. All right. So let us then see how the improvement of this grading system changes your outlook. In the past, we'd say, OK, let us look at the mitotic count, that's the cell division count, and go from a, a low grade from a G1 to a high grade to G3. So these are the mitosis, which means cells are dividing. And you go from less than 2, 2 to 20, greater than 20. And a, a, a chi 67 index, less than 2, 3 to 20, greater than 20. And you put these two together, you find that if you've got a low mitotic index and a low chi squared index over here, that you have a very good prognosis. You see that? If you have an, a, an intermediate level, the prognosis is worsened. And, and if you have a, a high grade mitotic count and a high chi, uh, a, a chi 67 index over here, then the prognosis is even worse. So you see how helpful that is to us now in terms of looking at that. So now let us quickly look at uh, what should we be measuring if we want to know if you've got one of these tumors and none of the standard measures are helpful to us. And I chose just one example. We all measure serotonin or 5 acetic acid when we're looking for a net, a carcinoid net. Don't we do that? Yeah, most of us do that. Now let me show you how bad that can be. This is if you've got a hindgut tumor and how often you will detect the tumor if you measure 5-HIA is zero. But if I measure chromogranin A, I'll pick up nearly 100% of them. Similarly, if you have a midgut tumor and I measure 5-HIA, I'll pick up about 30% of them. But I will pick up about eight, close to 80% if I use chromogranin A. And if you have a midgut carcinoid, I'm showing you there too that chromogranin A is better. So do you know what a sedimentation rate is? We measure the rate of the blood sedimentation. When we want to know if somebody is a malingerer, if they don't really have a disease, we do one measurement. If the sedimentation rate's high, we know they've got disease. If it's not high, we say, hmm, OK? Not always. But this is our sedimentation rate. It tells us whether there are many confounders for that measurement as well. And uh, you're going to hear more about that from Dr. Odorizio. The only reason I'm putting the neurokinin A in, the, I've taken out quite a few of these slides, is I want to show you what it has taught us uh, in terms of survival. Uh, and, and this is work from our deal with Turner's group. <laughs> Patients in whom neurokinin A levels continue to rise despite treatment with somatostatin analogs, the, uh, the one-year survival changes from 87% to 40%. That means if you can't control it. Let me just show you the data from that group. If you look at a neurokinin A level that is greater than 50, the one-year survival here is about, a, uh, uh, about 40%, 47%. If you look at a neurokinin A level that is uh, less than 50, the one-year survival now, as I showed you, is over 80%. You see the difference? But I'll show you what's even better. What has happened in the last 20 years is the, this has changed dramatically. So even people with high neurokinin A levels are getting much better survival. Do you see this? Up to six years. And people with low uh, neurokinin levels can survive indefinitely. What's happened? We got better at treating the condition. And that's one of the nice things, because there was a paper published uh, by Dr. Modlin, which uh, the title was The Rapid Pace of No Progress in Treating Nets. And uh, the paper is wrong because we, there has been lots of progress. And we can really make a difference in that regard. So hmm? He wants to, him to go back to the, he also comes from Africa, incidentally. You, I'm not going to tell you funny stories right now. But, uh, <laughs> So now let us say, what does this mean? Now I'm going back to this figure. And I'm going to insert into this figure some of the things we now know. And the first thing you're going to see is there's the rate of tumor growth. 
And I told you it takes 9.2 years. So what do we want? We want a measure that's going to help us find this tumor earlier. So let's put that measure in. That's going to be chromogranin A. Now we want something that's going to tell us how steeply up this curve you're going to go and uh, the progression of the tumor. And now we measure pancreas statin, and you'll hear more about that. Now we also want a measure that's going to tell you whether you're going to survive or you're not going to survive and how long you're going to live, right? And now we have another measure and we put that in there. So this is the advance that we've made now in the last few years with ability to detect, ability to prognosticate, ability to tell you about survival. And that's a long, we've come a long ways uh, in the last few years. Now let's go and talk a little about the symptom complex. Flushing. Uh, occurs in uh, patients with NETS. I've given you pictures of a lot of different people who have flushing and the way they can flush. But in essence, we want to know if you're, when you flush, if it's dry, if you don't sweat with it. Because if you don't sweat with the flush, it's always a tumor. If you sweat with the flush, it may be a tumor and you're anxious about it. But if it's dry, you've got a tumor. And uh, that's a good rule. And here are the causes of flushing. And we ask you lots of questions because if it's carcinoid, people will have diarrhea and wheezing. If it's medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, you'll have a mass that we can feel in the neck. And there's a family history, often feel chromocytoma. And notice I have things such as diabetes, menopause, autonomic epilepsy. I'm trying not to touch that. Good. Autonomic epilepsy, panic syndromes, mastocytosis, uh, that means you make too much histamine, polycythemia, foods have become, and you're going to hear uh, from Bill Gow about the foods you mustn't eat. And we find alcohol, monosodium glutate, nitrates, blue cheese, tyramine-containing foods, dark chocolate, and red wine, and the most common one we find today are preservatives for dried fruits. That produce, you, have I killed your appetite? Or killed the food? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a tyramine releasing <laughs> activity too. All right. So, so, and then I put here when we say we don't know, well, niacin, and this is brought up uh, at the table last night in discussion about we treat a lot of people with niacin. And the question is, it's one of the most potent drugs we have for producing a flush. And uh, we are doing a lot of studies on the mechanism of niacin-induced flushing as well. If we have time, we can talk about that. And I always put this in here, is when we say we don't know, I call that the diagnosis of the destitute. <laughs> so at some point, we try to get to know about all the causes. Now, we can actually diagnose all of these with simple tests. We can measure substances. And I'm just giving you one example along this list. You have the whole list. Uh, and that is, if we think of carcinoid, remember, we'll measure chromogranin. But now we'll also measure pancreastatin and urokinin. When we even think about it, there are other things we measure there, too. For measurably carcinoma, calcitonin becomes our measurement. Uh, and then for pheochromosoma, fractionated metanephrines. Down here, we have this little chap here, the panic syndrome as well. And uh, most of us can recognize that very simply by asking one question. Can you stand at the top of a building and look down? Can you go into an elevator and not mind the other people in the elevator? Are you a phobic person? Are you an anxious person? It helps. And then if you can't make the diagnosis, we can measure certain things which will tell us it's really panic syndrome and it's not. Now, if you want to know what my bread and butter is in life, my bread and butter is to exclude nets. So I see all these people over here, but nobody wants to believe that. So Dr. Waltering taught me something. He said, those people are called the, you haven't heard him, the wannabes. <laughs> so I spend my life excluding wannabes over there. There are people who would like to have the syndrome but don't really have it. The other common condition I've got right down here, it's called, you can't see that properly. This is hypomastia and mitral valve prolapse. If you've got a little prolapse of the mitral valve, it will produce the same clinical syndrome. And women get the syndrome and they have small breasts. And that was recognized by Dr. Goldberg with me and when we were still in Michigan days. She walked around and said, all these people who get this flushing funny syndrome have got, they don't have a net, have got small breasts. And, uh, and then she said, I wonder what that is all about. And then we found out that that was part of the disturbance you had when you had mitral valve prolapse. 
so we could recognize that. So you may want to know, why is he examining my breasts? Now you know why. All right. The other is, over here, is to look at this. So you can guess what I'm going to talk about now. But you're not going to go there and help the guy and yank him out. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the diarrhea. Now remember what I said to you about the flushing. If it's dry, it's a, a tumor. Here you've got to ask one other thing. And I ask the question, and, and people have heard me talk about this before. I say, what happens to your diarrhea on Ramadan during the day, not at night, that they eat at night? If the diarrhea persists, it's a tumor. If they don't understand me, I say, what happens to the diarrhea on Yom Kippur? And if, and if it persists, it's a tumor. And if they don't understand that, then I say, okay, we're not, you're not going to eat for a day. I'll put up an IV. I want to see what happens to your diarrhea. And that becomes really important because there are certain things that can masquerade. I mean, there's the watery diarrhea, hypokalemia syndrome. There's gastronoma syndrome, carcinoid, medullary carcinoma, the thyroid, secreting bullets adenoma of the rectum. But this one over here lets people down over and over and over. Surreptitious laxative abuse. I, I was at, the, uh, I, uh, at home in, in Norfolk, and the dean from the University of Virginia came in to talk to me about this program. And he said, I don't want to talk to you about it. I want to present a case to you. So he presented a case to me. I hope the patient or the person is not here. And I said, I know what the person's got. So he said, what are you talking about? He said, I've just told you the story. We've been working on her for months. So I said, your patient has got surreptitious laxative abuse. She's learned that this will give you a false positive uh, measure for 5 hydroxy and acetic acid, and she's just filling it, and, and so she's masquerading. So he said, well, I don't believe you. And then I went to lecture day here at the National Institute of Health three months later, and the head of the department said to me, I want to present a case to you, and he started presenting the same case. So I said, I know the patient. So he said, how do you know the patient? You've never seen the patient. I said, I heard it. I heard it from the dean of the University of Virginia, the same patient, the same description, and I said, I know what the patient's got, and I told her the same thing. And then I met her at the Endocrine Society meetings, and she said, guess what? We confronted her, and it was true. So this is a very big thing we have to deal with, too. So they are great wannabes. Now, the mechanism of diarrhea syndromes are quite different in the two conditions. If you're producing too much gastrin, it stimulates the stomach to make acid, and it increases acid secretion, which paralyzes a number of those enzymes, such as amylase, lipase, and trypsin, and impairs the absorptive capacity, and so you get increased fecal volume. Now we ask one more question. There's only one diarrhea that will disappear if you take a proton pump inhibitor because it suppresses acid secretion. So you ask that question. So I've told you about wet flushing and dry flushing. Okay? I've told you about Ramadan and Yom Kippur with the diarrhea. And now I've told you about PPIs. Anybody says to you, my di diarrhea goes away with the PPI, they've got a gastronoma until proved otherwise. Okay? And then on the other side is if you're making VIP pancreatic polypeptide, uh, 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 calcitonin or CGRP and others, that increases net secretion of fluid ions, which exceeds the absorptive capacity. Those are the diarrheas that uh, persist with fasting. This is how we find out about those people who are cheating. We measure the osmolarity of the stool. And that must be about equal to twice the sodium and the potassium content. Otherwise, there's something else in that stool, and it's usually a laxative. And so we can detect it. And that's exactly what we had to do in that case. Now, I'm not telling you guys that you're all doing this. I'm just showing you the complexity of uh, making the diagnosis. So now, what does the future hold for people with nets? Let's look at that. Remember I showed you the neurokinin story? I showed you the, all those generations of the SEARS database and how far we've come now, just in listening to the story about neurokinin. We've come a long way, but we are still striving for curing the disease, and we're still striving for getting better and better therapies. So I want to share that with you. And this is just an outline, and everybody's got an outline, is when we look at metastatic carcinoid tumors, non-operative candidates get chemoembolization, radiofrequency ablation, get reevaluated for surgery. If they have metastatic tumors that, that can be resect, the primary tumor is resected even in the case of metastases and on the lymph nodes removal, because if you debulk these tumors, they become more responsive to therapy. And then medical therapy to prevent carcinoid crises. You deal with the hepatic metastasis, the tumor bulk, and the systemic spread 
usually with debulking and palliative surgery, slight reduction of metastases, and you'll hear a lot more about that. But medical therapy for symptomatic relief, and then I put down right here at the bottom, consider a clinical trial. Now, I run a lot of trials, as you know, and uh, we all do. And so the question is, have we learned anything from the clinical trials, and have we come our ways with what we can do with the new drugs? So the first peptide we had back in the late 70s, early 80s, is somatostatin. And somatostatin does a whole lot with cell signaling. It actually affects potassium transport and calcium transport when it binds to its five different types of receptors on the cell membrane. It works through an adenate cyclase, cyclic AMP system to change secretions. But it also works through a system that involves MAP kinase, which is involved in apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, killing cells, and also cell proliferation. So we see that it affects secretion and it affects cell growth and proliferation. And in all those years, since we did those early studies and published them in 1978, we believed only that the drug affected your symptom complex, like the flushing and the diarrhea. Let's just probe that one a little bit further. We now have, there's human somatostatin, uh, a 14 amino acid peptide, and the, and the biological core are just these little four amino acids here. So the analog that's being made, this only has a half-life of about three minutes. So it's hard. You have to give it by a constant infusion. And some of you may be on pumps. And that's how we deliver it to get a, a constant level. Our creotide has had a substitution. You see this uh, here. So that with this substitution, it has a half-life of about 100 minutes. So we can give you an injection maybe three times a day or four times a day. And there's a lanreotide, another analog, which has a similar half-life to our creotide. So we have different somatostatin analogs. Uh, why has that become important? It's become important because there are the five receptors. And the major binding sites that occur for somatostatin 14, its precursor somatostatin 28, you look at the low numbers over here, and the low numbers tell you what it's binding to. And the major binding site is somatostatin receptor 2 and somatostatin receptor 5. Octreotide and lanreotide do a very good job of binding here and there. But notice the very high numbers for receptor 4, the high numbers for receptor 1. So what do we need? We need another analog which will bind to the other places, right? And so now comes along the newest kid on the block, passereotide or SOM230. And now that gives us good binding to 2, uh, good binding to 5, but it also binds to the receptor 1 and may give us an advantage in terms of the trials are being completed now. And there's some nice early data to suggest that. This is also made use of in peptide receptor radiotherapy, looking at the different types of uh, 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 peptides that have been bound to different radio traces to look at the binding to the ma two major types. But you notice again that we have a problem that they don't bind uh, one and they don't bind four very well. So we also know that down the road we will have better analogs for even peptide receptor radiotherapy. And those of you who listened to the news know that the FDA just last week has approved a site in Texas for uh, uh, introducing peptide into this country. Otherwise, everybody we sent overseas. Now, if you want to compare quickly that the somatostatin analogs, we're doing this clinical trial right now. That's octreotide LAR and lanreotide. And the, the difference being, as you see, this LAR has got this long needle with this syringe, and many of you know this very well. And the lanreotide depot uh, over here has got the shorter needle and the finer syringe and uh, has a very much different volume compared with the two. But we will know whether they're comparable in terms of biologic activity. Let's go back to the other question. It's not only controlling flushing and diarrhea. What would you like to control? Tumor growth, proliferation, get regression of the tumor. This is the PROMED study. It's the first study ever done, which was placebo controlled. Not a lot of people, but they now use somatostatin in 85 patients with locally inoperable metastatic, well-differentiated mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. And the time to progression when people on octreotide was 14.3 months, and the time to progression on people on placebo was six months, a doubling in the rate of progression if you're on placebo, all right? Or half the rate of progression. 
So that's the first study to say it doesn't only control your symptoms, it controls tumor growth. I'm going to leave this one out. You'll hear more about it later, about the use of the peptide receptor radiotherapy to talk to you about the efficacy of that. So somatostatin in nets are safe and effective. Long-term administration has proved safe and effective. And they can control symptoms, some tumor markers, but now we've learned that they may actually control tumor growth and proliferation as well. And we're excited that we actually now have the evidence to support it. So this is now the other side of the coin. This is showing you that neuroendocrine tumors are involved in, this is <coughs> the PI3 kinase, AKT mTOR pathway. Uh, it's a lot for you to swallow, but this is the pathways for growth and proliferation of tumors. So these are growth factor mediated. And important growth factors are IGF-1, platelet-derived growth factor, and vasoendothelial-derived growth factor. There are other growth factors involved as well, such as uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 those that are activated by tyrosine kinases, such as the red proto-oncogene. There are inherited syndromes associated with NETS. Multiple endocrine uh, neoplasias associated with the gene abnormality in uh, the red proto-oncogene, the type 2. And this is the tuberous sclerosis complex, which is also uh, involves a tyrosine kinase activation in the mTOR pathway for growth and survival. Therapeutic agents now, we have monoclonal antibodies, which will neutralize VEGF. We now have sunitinib and serafinib, which will decrease the activity of these three growth factors in the red proto-oncogene. And we have everolimus, uh, uh, which will inhibit the mTOR pathway. So let us quickly finish up and talk about where we are with this. Do you know how mTOR was discovered? It was discovered on this island. Anybody recognize this island? Easter Island. And that's wonderful. So if you've traveled. And what they found is that there was a, a substance in the soil that could prolong or extend lifespan by up to 38%. So everybody thought that was phenomenal. And now you're going to, this was the fountain of life and the fountain of youth. And we'll be able to take this and live forever. It does work in rats. <laughs> but the question is there, maybe a United Kingdom expert said that he warned against using this drug to extend lifespan because it could also suppress immunity. And that was the fear with the mTOR inhibitor. Now let us take this just a little further. Here's mTOR at the center of this cascade. And down below you'll see cell growth and proliferation and angiogenesis, that's blood vessel proliferation. You cannot grow a tumor unless it has a blood supply. And you're going to hear from Dr. Waltering a whole lot more about that. Oh, yeah. But mTOR does a lot of other things. mTOR is known to stimulate insulin secretion from the pancreas and sensitize the body to the actions of insulin. So when people like Gail Levy in Israel were studying it, they said this is going to be a great drug for the treatment of diabetes. So two things were thought about this mTOR pathway. One is that it might prolong your life, and the other it may be a drug for diabetes. But what they didn't know was that what activated this pathway were those growth factors such as IGF-1 and VEGF, which bound to their receptors on the plasma membrane and stimulated the formation of mTOR and activated this acting through the TSC complex, which increased cell growth and proliferation. So what would you do if you were trying to utilize this information? You say, I need a mTOR inhibitor. If I can turn that off, this mTOR, if I can turn that off with a drug like rapamycin, and that's what the R is, it's rapamycin, then I'm going to stop angiogenesis, I'm going to stop cell growth, I'm going to produce resistance to the action of insulin, and I'm going to decrease your insulin secretion, and so that may be good for people with malignant insulinomas, right? True? Yeah, it's absolutely true. This is, now it doesn't respond to me anymore. We just showed this very nicely. Matt was here and myself in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology. A person who was 86 years of age who had intractable hypoglycemia with a pancreatic uh, tumor with extensive metastases and he'd been given up for loss. His blood sugars were always around 20 milligrams per deciliter and he was always hypoglycemic. And we asked him one question, what would you like out of life? He said, I'd like to go back to playing golf again and, uh, you know, and being the healthy person I was. It's now three years later, he's 89 years of age and he's playing golf. So this is what happened to him. His insulin levels were reduced. We made him resistant to the action uh, of uh, insulin. So his 
so we were able to maintain his blood glucose, and his pancreastatin levels dropped uh, precipitously, and you're going to hear more about why that was a good sign. We knew that we were getting on top of him. Uh, now, what has emerged from that? This paper has just been published by Yao and colleagues from MD Anderson. It's a multi-center study on the, called the Radiant uh, One study, but now there are three is out, and Radiant is the use of the drug Everolimus. It's an mTOR inhibitor, just exactly like I've shown you. And the data on this suggests that the overall response rate is about 7.5 or 8 percent, and the uh, by central review that uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, a placebo versus drug, that they had about a 77 percent uh, response rate with the treatment. That ma needs to be re uh, reviewed very tightly, but I'll show you what it looks like. What it looks like, if you are measuring progression-free survival, the progression-free survival with rad alone, that's Everolimus, is 9.3 months, and you increase the survival by combining it with Sandostatin and LAR. So the message there is that we should be using the drugs in combination because they work entirely differently. All right. Now let's take that a little bit further, that you now see that if we look at the overall survival, notice that Everolimus by itself, that if you take time out here, going to about a 50% survival, it's about 14 months. But if you have them on Sandestat and LAR, even at 18 months when they reach the end of the, that portion of the study over there, people are still surviving if you use the combination. So that's a nice new place. The addition of an mTOR inhibitor with Sandestat. Let's move on and summarize this, and then I have one more or two more slides for you. The, there's a limited therapeutic options for patients with advanced NETs. The activation of mTOR pathway supports net growth and promotes angiogenesis. Everolimus is well tolerated mTOR inhibitor that can be safely administered alone or in combination, and it's shown strong anti-tumor activity in advanced NETs. Together, Everolimus and somatostat may act synergistically in the treatment of pancreatic NETs, and future strategies will evaluate combination therapies with the other things that I've spoken to you about, like timazolamide, passereotide, and bevacizumab. Let us switch for the last few minutes to the, uh, to the other side of that coin. Remember I told you that pathway involved tyrosine kinase? The tyrosine kinases, there are abnormal mutations that are, uh, of the red proto-oncogene in multiple endocrine neoplasia. There may be mutations in medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, pheochromocytoma, Hirschsprung, and certain cancers. Now, this tyrosine kinase over here is activated by the binding of these growth factors, like epidermal growth factor, VEGF and PDGF. And it turns on the phosphorylation of tyrosine, which starts a cellular response, uh, and that uh, with the activated tyrosine kinase. What the nice thing about that is, is that it acts at three different levels, at the pericyte, at the vascular endothelial cell and at the tumor cell, three different places that the drug acts, and that you would expect that you'd get reduced blood supply, that would cause uh, apoptosis, inhibition of tumor growth, and actually uh, uh, death of tumor cells. Is this true and does it happen? This is a worldwide multicenter study presented uh, at the World Congress of Gastroenterology and this last year at the American uh, Oncology Society meetings in, in Chicago. Phase three randomized double blind trial of sunitinib versus placebo with progressive. So uh, the people on the placebo got placebo. People uh, in the dr drug treatment arm got 37.5 milligrams per day of sutent or sunitinib. The types of tumors that were treated were gastronomers, glucagonomers, insulinomers, bipomers, and other uh, tumors as well. And here you see the, the beautiful separation of uh, progression-free survival increasing uh, from 5.5 months to 11.1 months uh, on the treatment, and the overall survival at the end of the study hadn't been reached yet on sunitinib at the end of the study. Uh, in addition to the above, uh, I can leave that out for the moment, there were some very dramatic examples, and I show them to you here, of this huge tumor undergoing necrosis and dying off uh, in the liver, the metastatic spread. So that patients treated with sedative exhibited comparable quality of life scores in global quality of life, and that's important to me in terms of making sure that people's quality of life improves. Additionally, treatment with sedative 
delayed deterioration is defined by a composite endpoint in emotional and physical functioning. So it has added another dimension to how we look after people to make sure that their quality of life is maintained or improved with this treatment. And the improvement of progression of pre-survival with sinitinib was achieved without adversely affecting quality of life. This is a worldwide study, and I take the opportunity now to thank all the other people we've worked with around the world who participated in this study to, to make it possible. Okay, so in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, in the 1900s, uh, we sent all the cases to Dr. Waltering, and he did surgery. And then... Oh, that's exactly right. Okay. And before we sent that other guy to Africa. <laughs> and, then, and then what transpires over here was the in introduction of chemotherapy, uh, embolization, chemoembolization, interferon, octreotide. And now we're at this wonderful stage down here below on growth factors and angiogenesis, inhibitors such as sinitinib, everolimus, and other novel therapies. And I haven't shared with you, but there are many others in the offing right now that are going to allow us to address this. So nets are small, slow-growing tumors with episodic expression. The diagnosis are often very difficult and late. You need a high index uh, of suspicion. Diagnosis is complex. There's no single foolproof measure. I've told you about the flushing. You've got to know about wet or dry. I've told you about the diarrhea. You've got to know about Yom Kippur and Ramadan. And then I've also told you about the emerging new syndromes that we're learning about uh, that are related to these hormones and even setting up an autoimmune process. The causes of all the symptoms are not clearly understood. Symptomatic therapy is very effective, and we always seek targeted primary therapy. We monitor not only the symptoms, not only the biochemistry, but tumor bulk, and they are often not parallel. We need to know all three for decision making. We are aggressive. We use tumor debulking procedures judiciously, and tumor growth can be arrested, and I've listed some of them, not all of them, but we can arrest tumor growth. Octreotide controls symptoms, but may also control tumor growth. And there are new therapies which are involve the PI3 kinase, uh, AKT, mTOR pathways, which have now entered the clinical arena, and they're in our hands for therapy. And many of us are actually using those in combination therapy. A lot of what I said appears in this textbook. Uh, it's www.endotex.org. It's free. You can download anything you like from it. It's updated every now and then, so it contains much, much of the information. Uh, that we shared, and it's free. So we don't understand why more people don't use it, but a lot of people do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Bob.